It has been suggested that Matt Dillahunty has an epistemology that functionally precludes the possibility of him believing in God. If that is true, does that suggest a problem with Matt's epistemology? Or does that suggest a problem with the idea of believing in God? There is a question that is often presented by Christians for atheists that has been making the rounds for a while, and lately it's gotten some traction. Christians. Christians that need answering. And the question is this. So what sort of evidence, if any, would be enough to convince you? Do you know? What would it take for you to believe in God? And this question is often followed with examples that have been growing increasingly absurd in the telling, essentially, starting from simple ideas like prayer, someone prays in the name of Jesus and somebody is healed, all the way to like a decapitated person suddenly rising again and having their head reattached. And as many people have pointed out, none of these ever appear in real life. These are all ridiculous hypotheticals. Now, I think... The degree of absurdity of these examples kind of misses the point. And I would like to discuss why it is that this question is so difficult to answer and a possible solution to that problem. As a little bit of an aside, to get us started, I'd like to bring up a response that Shannon Q and Paula had uh, for Braxton's video. And I'm going to play a clip of it here. Personal experience obviously would be compelling for me but not necessarily compelling for other people. And that's okay. Personal experience, it would have to be. The really fundamental issue that I think Paul brings up in here is the idea of personal experience. Now, personal experience is a huge driver of our beliefs and our ideas, and rightly so. The way we experience reality is through our own immediate personal experience. There's no other way around that. It's how, why we believe something else exists aside from us. I mean, there's that old chess note about you can tell a child a million times to not touch a hot stove burner, and they believe that that burner is going to hurt them, but the moment they touch it and actually get burned, now they know. That's the power of personal experience, and those personal experiences can be good and they can be problematic at the same time. And uh, I'd like to give a little example from my own life. Uh, for many years, I avoided getting a flu shot. I mean, I was younger and healthy and I rarely get sick. Um, and I wasn't in a high risk category and I'm terrified of needles. So I avoided getting the flu shot for reasons like that. And then one year, maybe 10 years ago or so, I decided, you know what? It's the right thing to do. I'm going to be a good citizen. I'm going to go get my flu shot. So I went and got the flu shot. And you know what happened? Immediately afterwards, I was as sick as I have ever been in my entire life with the flu. It was miserable. Now, I know intellectually that there is no way you can get the flu from a flu shot. It's just not possible. And I know that flus have gestational periods and I was inside, it was not enough time for me, even if I had been injected with a live flu virus, for me to have gotten the flu. So consciously, cognitively, I knew that I, I did not get the flu from the flu shot. And yet the power of that personal experience was enough to again make me opt to not get the flu shot. And then this year, this past year, when COVID hit, doctors were strongly recommending that people get the flu shot and it makes sense to protect yourself. So once again, I was the good citizen and I went to get the flu shot and I did not get sick with the flu immediately afterwards, but I felt a great amount of trepidation, not just because I was getting a shot, even though I hate needles, but also that fear, that memory, that personal experience of getting sick, badly sick, after getting a flu shot stuck with me and was overriding 
my rationality. So I think as a reasonable person, we have to allow for the possibility that I could have a some kind of personal experience that would lead me to change my position and believe in God. I don't know what form that personal experience would take. And the me now would probably look at a me that did that and say, you're not being rational about this. And I might not be. I mean, it might not be a rational decision, but the power of the personal experience is so great. It could potentially drive me to that place. That's hard to say. But I think that's an important thing to consider, an important thing to keep in mind. Now, to move on a little bit, how do we answer this question? What would it take for you to believe in God? And a lot of times the response is, and this is the one that was famously coined by Matt Delahunty and gets repeated frequently is, I don't know what it would take for me to believe. But a God does, and if they knew, they would do that if they wanted me to know that they existed. And I think that's a fair point. And I think it's also very fair to say, what I, don't, I just don't know what it would take for me to believe. But I think the problem comes in, and, and this is what I've seen a lot lately. Again, it's this continuing absurdity or nonsensical nature of the what-ifs that keep getting piled on and piled on. First, what if someone laid hands on and healed someone in Jesus' name? Would that convince you? And we give reasons for why not. And then, okay, well, what if someone parted a sea in Jesus' name? What if uh, the moon suddenly exploded and spelled out, I am God in Hebrew and Greek? What if someone was decapitated and half an hour later they were up again walking around and telling you secrets that supposedly came from the beyond? I think this misses the point of why these things are not convincing for us. And it's not the degree of the miraculous nature of the event, because they all have the same fundamental flaw. So, to illustrate this and to get to what I think we need to understand this, let's take a really simple example. Imagine there was somebody who could heal. They would lay hands on and in Jesus' name heal, but they can only heal small cuts. Like anything bigger than what requires one or two stitches, they can't do that. But anything under that, They'll lay their hands on, and you could watch as that cut healed itself up and went away. And they put the hands on, they'd be like, in Jesus' name, you're healed, and the cut heals itself as you watch. And you could do this over and over again. This was consistently de demonstrable, a thing that you could see. Would that be convincing? Would that be enough reason for you to believe in God? Well, here's some possible explanations. One, God did it. Sure, possibly. Um, another possible explanation is they have a secret healing machine that they've developed and they hide wires on their hands and when they touch, it creates a healing reaction, accelerated healing reaction in the body. Maybe they're a psychic and they psychically move the edges of the wound together and generate a, a message that tells the cells to rebuild that area much more quickly. These are all, uh, maybe they create a tiny pocket of accelerated time around the wound and it heals normally, but at an extremely time accelerated rate. I mean, these are all hypothetical possible explanations. So, how do we figure out which of these explanations is actually what's happening? What methodology do we use? And that is the key. Someone would propose that God is the reason why these are healing, that, that someone laying their hands on saying Jesus did it, and then it's God did it. By what methodology can we test that hypothesis, that suggestion? And that is the key piece that I think is missing from all of these, is a lack of methodology for testing the proposed hypothesis. And you can think of all the most ridiculous examples and you could think of possible, you know, extraordinary reasons why it could be that don't include God. Someone parts the sea, maybe they're telekinetic and they can move the waters with their mind. 
and part things. And and uh, if the moon smashes, maybe uh, there's aliens creating a hallucination. We all think that the moon smashed. Um, someone's decapitated and they rise from the dead. Maybe it was a life model decoy or a quickly accelerated grown clone with implanted thoughts that was actually killed and then the real person comes out later. I mean, you can think of all these wild and crazy explanations, but you would need a methodology to test between them to figure out which one of them is true. So this is the part that I would throw back to the Christians. Propose a methodology by which we could test your claim that God did it. And then we can figure out if that is a possible explanation. And I think here's, here's one of the really big tricks, is that so much of God belief is so vaguely defined that it's really hard to nail these things down. I mean, what is spiritual? What is a spirit? What is a spirit being? Do we know? And often this gets defined in terms of negative. People will say a spirit is a non-corporeal entity. Well, that's not helpful. It doesn't tell me what it is. It tells me what it's not. Like, let's say I have this widget I'm going to give you, and you say, well, what's the widget? And I'll say, it's not a can opener. Does that tell you anything about what it is? No, it just tells you what it's not. So we would need really definitive definitions and ideas about God just being the creator being that created all of reality is completely not helpful because it doesn't give us any any defined characteristics, any appreciable characteristics that we can look at and test and say, okay, so this being is does this, and we would know that if God is enacting here because we would see this as a result of it. And I realize this is kind of along the lines of the scientific method, but this is what we need. This is, this is why none of these examples, like if such and such happened, wouldn't you believe it's God? Like one that was raised today on Twitter by Braxton was if you could part water and Jesus saw someone who parted an ocean in Jesus' name and you still wouldn't believe. Well, the example I put up was what if they were telekinetic and they moved it and they were going with the idea of the Jesus metaphor or mythos or tapping into the Jesus, the Christ idea, because they know that people will start to believe that. And if you think about this, I mean, I, this is, I think this is a great example because let's say I developed telekinetic powers and let's say they were moderate. Like I can't move anything heavier than I could physically lift and carry. And there goes my air compressor. So, you know, like upwards of 180 pounds or something like that. If I could do that and I wanted to make money at it, I would claim it's the power of God, the power of Christ. And I would get up on a stage with Catholic priests and televangelists and rabbis and imams and anyone else that would get up on stage with me. And I'd go up and I'd say, by the power of Jesus, I'm going to raise you off the ground. And I would raise them a few inches off the ground or a foot off the ground and set them back down again. And I'd be like, okay, now you do the same to me to prove that you have the power of God. And if I did that, I'll guarantee within a few years, I am going to be the leader of the largest religion on the face of the earth because I would be able to demonstrate that power over and over and over again. But that doesn't mean there's a God. Like in this scenario, there is no God. It's just me developing telekinetic powers. But so no matter how outrageous your examples get, we're still missing the methodology for how to pin down that that is actually God at work. And just saying in the name of Jesus Christ doesn't do it because it's treating the name of Jesus Christ like a, a, a mantra or something, like a, a power word or something like that. But even more than that, even the Bible says that there's a problem with this because even the Bible says that people will work miracles in Jesus' name and I never knew you. You're a false prophet or a false believer. So even the Bible warns against looking at something like someone just saying in the name of Jesus Christ as a confirmation piece. There needs to be more to it than that. So even by a Christian epistemology, this fails. This fails greatly. Hopefully I'm making the point, but the point I would really like to hammer home again is this. We need a methodology and the person making the claim needs to develop 
that methodology because it's their idea. And without that methodology, we are left in a morass of not being able to answer the question because we have no way of getting the truth of that question, of whether or not God exists, or what would it take for me to believe that God exists. So anyway, thanks for taking time to watch this. I hope it was interesting. Maybe I get my ideas across. Um, peace out. Love to everyone.